Well, hey everybody, today's video is on how to properly test thyroid function. And so what you're gonna learn are the top signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. So we'll talk a little bit about hyperthyroidism, but mostly we're gonna focus on underactive thyroid function. And we're gonna put a lot of emphasis on functional low thyroid function. So you're gonna understand the difference between clinical hypothyroidism and functional low thyroid testing. I'm going to talk about at-home testing for thyroid problems. A couple of things you can do at home without labs to help you better understand if your thyroid function is not function is not working at its best. We're going to talk about the brain, thyroid, liver, gut connection, how all these systems are interconnected. And if there is a thyroid issue, that most likely it's actually an issue with the brain, the liver, or the gut, or possibly all of them. And so we're going to talk about that connection. I'm also going to go over thyroid labs and optimal ranges. We're going to talk about uh, the most, most common conventional labs for thyroid. And we're going to talk about functional labs, different functional analysis and what you're going to be able to understand from that. We're going to talk about six key patterns of hypothyroidism. It's not just one standard pattern. There's actually a number of different ways that uh, and mechanisms for the development of hypothyroidism and also for the development of functional low thyroid uh, health. We're also going to talk about key nutrients for thyroid hormone production, conversion, and utilization. So you guys are going to get a lot out of this video. Always important to remember, this video is not meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any medical condition, and it's for informational purposes only. The video is not a treatment protocol and does not replace a consultation with a healthcare practitioner. You are fully responsible for what you do or don't do with the information in this presentation. So let's start with the symptoms, most common symptoms of hypothyroidism. You're going to see just lower energy in general, trouble losing weight. So you have to remember the thyroid, thyroid hormone helps stimulate the mitochondria to produce more energy, which produces more heat within the cells. So when we're not able to produce more energy and heat, we tend to be more fatigued. We don't burn fat as effectively. So we can have weight loss resistance. Um, we're going to have brain fog, our mitochondria. We have the most dense area of mitochondria in our brain. So brain issues, uh, libido issues uh, is, is, you know, a very, very common thing. Um, we're also going to have, uh, you know, issues, depression, anxiety, right? Mood disorders, things like that. Also, thyroid gland plays a really important role in sebum production in the skin, as well as um, just the hair follicle. So the maturation of the hair follicle. So one of the big things I look at are the outer third of the eyebrows. And so if we're seeing a loss of hair on the outer third of the eyebrows, it's one of the classic signs that somebody is not getting enough thyroid hormone. They may also have dry skin, dry hair. They may have swelling around their throat. So hoarseness is common, having to clear their throat a lot, trouble swallowing because they may have swelling around their thyroid. So that's common. Also high cholesterol. So thyroid hormone actually helps to activate the LDL receptor. And so sometimes people have very high LDL uh, cholesterol because they're not getting activation of the LDL receptor because they don't have enough thyroid hormone. So very important there. Also constipation because thyroid hormone helps to activate the migrating motor complex and the peristaltic activity of the gut. Also heart rate, right? So they may have very, very slow heart rate. Whereas with hyperthyroidism, it's the opposite. They have too much heat and too rapid of heart rate. In fact, that's where hyperthyroidism, too much thyroid hormone can actually be very dangerous is because people can develop tachycardia and arrhythmias from it because the thyroid hormone is overactivating the heart rate. But when you have hypothyroidism, you tend to be colder and you have a very slow heart rate. So you feel more fatigued, more out of breath because you're not getting enough blood enough blood flow out. So anyways, these are all the, the, the most classic signs of hypothyroid symptoms. And when we're looking at hypothyroidism, you know, we're looking at basically like a functional hypothyroidism and an autoimmune. So we know that about 90, 95% of true hypothyroidism, where true clinically diagnosed hypothyroidism is actually related to an autoimmune condition. And we know that hyperthyroidism is also an autoimmune condition. This is where the body's immune system actually attacks the thyroid gland. And in the case of Hashimoto's, you, you attack the thyroid gland and now the thyroid gland is not able to produce enough thyroid hormones. So you have too little. 
And with Hashimoto's, you can actually bounce up and down, especially during the kind of symptomatic or autoimmune flare. People can jump up where they have too much thyroid hormone and then boom, they drop down with too little. Whereas Graves is characterized by just chronically too much thyroid hormone. Um, and again, it's autoimmune. So it's the autoimmunity, the antibodies are actually triggering too much production of thyroid hormone. And so you're getting that, that you're getting bombarded. Your cells are getting bombarded with the message to produce more energy. So you get hot, you, your heart starts to race. Um, you can develop a condition where your eyeballs are actually bulging exothalmosis it's called. So a lot of dangers that can take place. You know, you're going to lose too much weight. You're going to be sweating all the time, dehydration with graves or with Hashimoto's it can, again, it can go up and down for most people. It just goes straight down, but I do see some people where they get their blood test one day and the thyroid hormone is elevated. And then the next day, you know, or a month later, the thyroid hormones down and they haven't had their thyroid removed or anything like that. Um, and so that happens now with functional hypothyroidism, your thyroid's okay. So there's not increased swelling. There's not, uh, you know, a clear evidence of tissue damage there. And, uh, you know, there's not antibodies, right? So we're not finding antibodies in the labs, but for whatever reason, you're not getting enough thyroid hormones. And so with that, you're told, well, it's in your head, right? Or if, you know, especially if you have a functional hypothyroidism, that is where, uh, you know, you're, you're not in the clinical range to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism, but we know that your levels are just not optimal. So you're not in the optimal range. And that's a key function here. And that's what we're going to look at with functional low thyroid. So again, you know, this is how we look at things in functional medicine. So we have a lab range and the way that they come up with these lab ranges is they look at basically the median levels for a whole wide range of people that go to labs, right? The issue is that for years, the people that went to labs were the people that had a lot of health conditions, not healthy people. So they were looking at what, what is the median for, and what is the, you know, the standard deviations away from median for people who are already sick. And that's how they came up with the ranges. Whereas with functional medicine, we actually want to know what is a really healthy person that feels great, where are their lab ranges? And that is what we're looking at here. And so you'll see that the functional lab ranges are a lot tighter than the clinical ranges. And in functional medicine, we are looking for functional abnormalities. We're not actually just trying to diagnose a disease. That is medical. Uh, that's you know your, your, your clinical or medical um, practice that they're going to actually be looking at chronic disease, whereas we're looking at functional health declines. And so one, a couple of things you can do at home. One is actually looking at what's happening with your thyroid. So if you're noticing like an increase in swelling in and around your throat region, because your thyroid sits basically right, right in your throat area. So if you're noticing a lot of hoarseness, voice changes, you know, that aren't associated with an upper respiratory infection, you're just noticing that pretty chronically, that could be an issue here. Difficulty breathing, because again, you've got the swelling there around your throat. Um, you know, you're noticing again, that the swelling there difficulty swallowing frequent choking, it's hard for you to swallow pills, for example, that's a common thing I hear. And that's oftentimes, again, this swelling in the thyroid that's putting pressure in the throat, not allowing the throat to expand when you drink water, when you're trying to swallow pills. So that's one thing to look at. You can also, you know, just do the, do the self test. So again, you're looking at this, you're kind of seeing when you tilt your head back, when you swallow some water, is there like a big bulge or protrusion in any area, right? And if you're noticing that, then definitely go see a doctor and have that examined in more detail. Another great thing to do is the basal body temperature. So the normal underarm temperature is 97.8 to 98.2. Now, you know that 98.6 is considered you know, your normal body temperature for, for most people. Yours may be slightly different. However, you know, the baseline range, that's why we give it like a, a 0.4 degree range should be somewhere between 97.8 to 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit or 36.6 to 37 degrees Celsius. If your temperature, when you're taking this, and I'm going to give you instructions for how to do this in just a second, but if you're taking this and you're consistently under 97.4 or 36.5, then you may, you may have a under-functioning thyroid activity. 
If the temperature is consistently above 99 degrees, then you may have hyperactive thyroid activity. Now, this isn't a diagnostic test. However, it can certainly help you understand what's happening and um, may persuade you to pursue further testing or not, uh, depending on where you're seeing your temperature range. Now, if you're menstruating, your temperature will naturally be higher during ovulation because that's when it makes the eggs more fertile. So in your menstrual cycle, uh, the day of ovulation is considered day 14. Day one is your first day of menstruation. So um, obviously you don't want to do that. You don't want to test it during ovulation because that could skew the results. So the best time to test would be the second day of menstruation. So you have your, your period starts the very next day, go ahead and, and uh, take your basal body temperature and you can take it daily if you want to, but never get closer to four days of pre-ovulation for accurate readings. So, you know, not, not, you know, close to day 10, for example. Um, now after ovulation, you know, if you know you ovulated, maybe take four days after that, and then you can also uh, go ahead and do the temperature readings as well. So like day, day 18 or so of your menstrual cycle. Now here's how you do it. Get an old fashioned mercury thermometer or a gallon stin, which is kind of the gold standard for this. And you can look that up on Amazon or something like that. You can find it, put it by your bedside, shake it down to 95 degrees is kind of like a starting point. Upon arising in the morning, so this is important before you get out of bed or eat or drink anything, put the thermometer deep in your armpit for 10 minutes. During that time, you just can chill, meditate, you know, uh, continue to rest and you record the temperature. Be sure to place it against your skin with the tip facing up into the armpit region. The process allows you to measure your lowest temperature of the day. And that temperature should be taken for four consecutive days. And that way you can kind of, you know that it's not just one day that would be skewing it. Now, if you're using an oral thermometer, it's a question I get a lot of times. People are like, okay, well, I want to do it just in the mouth. You know, these things are common. It's very common to get an oral thermometer. You have to realize that your oral temperature is typically about a half degree higher. So you have to subtract a half degree from your result to make it closer to your underarm temperature. So you can do that. What we found again is that it's about a half degree higher. So if using the gallon stint or mercury thermometer in your mouth, leave it in for five minutes. The normal underarm temperature is 97.8 to 98.2. If your temperature is consistently under 97.4, 36.5, like we talked about earlier, then you most likely have under-functioning thyroid activity. Now we can't say you have hypothyroidism because we're not diagnosing it. However, your thyroid is probably not functioning at its optimal level. And that's why we use that term under-functioning or low-functioning thyroid activity. Now, let's talk about why the body may downregulate thyroid hormone. And there is a growing and emerging theory called the cell danger response. And this is a natural process where our mitochondria protect and defend themselves and our bodies from threats such as infections, toxins, physical or psychological trauma, and other environmental stressors. So if we have some sort of psychological trauma, physical trauma, we were sexually abused or physically abused or we have some sort of chronic infection or we've been exposed to some major toxins and chemicals or, you know, perhaps a number of these things. And we have enough of a, you know, we hit a certain threshold with these stressors. Now the cell starts to shut down and it needs to go through a full healing cycle in order to, you know, kind of get back to a balanced or homeostatic state. If it can't do that, if it gets stuck in what's called the cell danger response, then it actually shuts down metabolic activity. And the reason for this is it actually wants to reduce energy production, right? So it can go through a, a healing cycle. It's kind of a defense mechanism. When it does that within the thyroid, and these are things we're gonna talk about, it can reduce T4 to T3 conversion in your liver um, because your liver plays a critical role in converting uh, active, well, we're going to talk a lot about this, inactive thyroid hormone T4 into active thyroid hormone T3. It also reduces the cellular uptake of T3, so the cell's response to active T3. And it also releases inflammatory agents that may damage thyroid tissue, the Hashimoto's. So oftentimes these thyroid issues are not actually like, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it actually may be a uh, physiological adaptation that the body is making to try to give us the best survival advantage. 
Now these changes should be normal. So you think about like when you have the flu, how do you feel? You have no energy, right? You have brain fog, you want to sleep. Um, you know, you have all these types of hypothyroid symptoms when you have the flu because the body's dealing with this virus. So the cells, the mitochondria go hypometabolic and these kinds of changes take place. The problem is when, you know, this should be for a short period of time and you should go through a healing cycle and get back to balance. The problem is when your cells get stuck in that solid danger response long-term, that's when we can develop hypothyroidism. So we want to really be able to address that. So when we look at the hypothyroid cycle, we know that the adrenals or really like the, the, the brains, what I call the neuroendocrine system. So the brain's ability to communicate effectively with the thyroid, right? And the adrenals and, you know, basically the, the brain's ability to tell our hormonal systems how to function and what to do, that gets disrupted. And if we have elevated stress hormones, that suppresses thyroid function. Why? Because both of those are gas pedals. And over time, we don't want too much gas, you know? So our stress response, our acute stress response may give us more energy in the short term, but long-term, it actually causes a lot of problems. So the body doesn't allow that to happen. So it down-regulates receptors. It creates bad feedback between the brain and the um, hormonal system. And now we get lower thyroid function. So when we have lower thyroid function, it slows down liver detoxification. So the thyroid helps activate the liver. So now the liver starts to slow down which then causes more toxins to be dumped into the gut. And that causes more inflammation in the gut, which triggers more, uh, more of a stress response in the body, right? It causes more hyperpermeability in the gut, leaky gut, dysbiosis, which causes more inflammation throughout the whole body and a heightened stress response. So these systems are all working together and we really have to balance all of them in order to optimize thyroid function. So gut health, leaky gut, inflammation, thyroid health, really all correlate. And so people that have low functional thyroid function, or in many cases, hypothyroidism, or autoimmunity, like Hashimoto's and Graves, you know, one of the root causes is leaky gut and immune dysregulation and a state of chronic inflammation that needs to be addressed. So let's look at how thyroid hormone is created and how it is turned into the active form of thyroid hormone. So we know that the hypothalamus, which is kind of like a major antenna in our brain, it sends a signal, thyroid releasing hormone, over to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, okay, now it gets that message, and it's, it sends another neuroendocrine hormone called thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH, to the thyroid. Now the thyroid, TSH tells the thyroid, produce thyroid hormone. Now that thyroid produces mostly T4, about 93% of what it produces is T4. T4 is an inactive form. It has four iodine molecules. We need a enzyme called 5-deodinase in order to cleave one of those and make T3. Now the thyroid does produce a little bit of T3, about 7% that can be used immediately by the cells. So it does produce some, However, the majority is actually metabolized in the liver and turned into T3. So again, that thyroid hormone goes to the liver where it's turned into the active form T3 that can now be used by the cells. 60% is converted there. There's another 20% that is converted to T3 sulfate and T3 acetate um, in the gut and the gut itself takes and breaks those down and converts those into active T3. So we need healthy gut, this gut bacteria in order to activate more T3. And then we also have another 20% that is converted to an inactive form called reverse T3, which is excreted from the body, right? So reverse T3 is something we can measure and that is an inactive form of T3. So there's these checks and balances to make sure that our body has enough active thyroid hormone, but not too much, because again, too much can cause a lot of unwanted problems, um, you know, just overactive metabolism, driving up oxidative stress, free radical damage and inflammation. The right amount makes us feel great. Too little, we don't get all of our body systems functioning well, our energetic systems, 
we feel really lousy. So it's really important that we get the right amount and our body kind of has this built-in check and balance system in order to make sure we do that. So let's look at the condition of primary hypothyroidism. When we look at levels, and this is your clinical lab levels, okay, to diagnose this, we need high TSH levels greater than 4.5 on the measurement tool. And so when we see that, the lab itself will flag it and say, okay, this is high. And then oftentimes, you know, now some doctors will actually just almost diagnose hypothyroidism just off the TSH, but typically we're looking at the T4 as well. And you're going to have low T4. So your T4 levels typically are going to be under 4.5. And that's a sign that the thyroid, again, the pituitary gland is screaming at the thyroid to produce hormone, but the thyroid is not able to produce enough hormone. Now, the most common cause for that primary hypothyroidism is, is autoimmunity. And there's just been too much damage that's taken place to the thyroid gland. It can't produce enough thyroid hormone, no matter how much of the signal it's getting from the brain to produce that hormone. Now, you may also see low T3 levels. Typically, most doctors are not even testing T3 in those cases, which is really the free active hormone that... Um, you know, is really stimulating the cells. So T4 is not stimulating the cells to produce energy. It's T3, which needs to be converted from T4. Now, again, we do produce 7% of our T3 directly from the thyroid, but majority of the T3 is coming from conversion of T4 to T3 in the liver, and then another 20% in the gut. So here's our optimal levels. This is where we want to see in functional medicine where these ranges are. Okay, now I don't base somebody's health off of, you know, just labs. We're, we're obviously looking at their symptoms. We're looking at their health history. We're looking at a wide, a wide variety of things, different questionnaires based around their health outcomes. You know, if somebody feels great and their TSH is a little bit high, we don't jump to, you know, treating that. However, we take note of it, right? So they may have some neuroendocrine inflammation, maybe some uh, disruption in their brain's ability to communicate with the thyroid, maybe they're underproducing, right? Maybe there is some destruction to the thyroid tissue. You know, maybe there are some other issues that we're going to talk about as we go on. So we will take note of it, but we don't necessarily treat it uh, unless we're seeing, you know, a number of lab signs as well as patient history and symptoms associated with it. So TSH should be between 0.5 and 2.0. Now I had mentioned how the clinical lab will mark it when it's over 4.5. So we have a much tighter range, 0.5 to 2.0. Um, T4 between six and 12, right? Now, again, I had mentioned how the clinical diagnosis would be under 4.5. So we like it higher than that. Obviously the ideal range is around eight to 10, right? So that's kind of the ideal range that we're looking at. Free T4, which is unbound. So you have different proteins, thyroid, thyroid binding globulin that is circulating in the bloodstream that binds thyroid hormone and makes it unavailable to get to the cells. Again, a check and balance system. Your free T4 is not bound, okay? And then we're also gonna look at free T3 because that's the actual active form that's unbound. So it's available to interact with the cells. You know, and that may be the most important of all of these measurements, the free T3. Now, most doctors, unfortunately, are not measuring a lot of these things. Most of them are just running TSH and T4. If you really want to run all these, so you can see the whole picture. So free T4, 1 to 1.5, T3, 100 to 150. Free T3 is 3 to 4. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And then reverse T3, 9 to 24. So T3 uptake is another test that we look at. And this really looks at the amount of sites that are available for active T3 or unbound T3 to bind with thyroxin binding proteins. The more binding sites that are available, the lower the T3 uptake will be. So elevated testosterone will reduce the binding sites, which will increase T3 uptake. And this is important to note as we go on, we're going to look at different uh, low thyroid functioning states, and one is associated with elevated testosterone, okay, and how that will actually increase the amount of free T3 and also increase the overall T3 uptake because the thyroid binding globulins are going to be more available. So there's more of a more availability to uptake it. Elevated estrogen, on the other hand, um, or low testosterone 
will increase the amount of binding sites and lower T3 uptake. This results in lower free T3 levels. So we're going to have less, or I'm sorry, we're going to have more binding globulin. When we have elevated estrogen, we're going to have lower levels of binding globulin when we have elevated testosterone, if that makes sense. So more estrogen, we produce more thyroid binding globulin, which grabs up more free T3. So then we're, therefore we have less free T3. If we have more testosterone, it reduces the amount of thyroid binding globulin. Therefore, we have more available T3. So here's kind of a, a screenshot analogy here that you can look at. Excess estrogen, uh, a condition that oftentimes we'll call estrogen dominance. Again, oral contraceptives can be you know, one of the factors behind that. Will cause the liver to produce high levels of thyroid binding globulin. And then that's going to cause more uptake of the thyroid binding globulin and a reduced overall free T3 level. Now, the, the, the language is confusing because you're actually your T3 uptake uh, will actually be lower, right? So your, your, your percentage will be lower because you have, um, you have more thyroid binding globulin grabbing up T3. However, you'll, and then, I'm sorry, and then you'll also have reduced free T3 levels. Now with, with testosterone, this is really probably the most important thing. This, with testosterone, so estrogen, you're going to have less free T3. With testosterone, you're going to have more free T3. Now the problem with that seems like it's a good thing if you have more free T3 because it's, you need that to activate the cells. However, over time, if we're uh, having this sort of increased amount of free T3, then that's actually going to cause our cells to downregulate their, their receptors, which therefore we get less activation at the cell. So the blood test could look good. You have good free T3, but your cells aren't interacting with it properly because of this condition. Now, we're also going to look at reverse T3. Reverse T3 is inactive and competes with thyroid hormone binding spots. Elevated levels block normal T3 activity and lead to a functional hypothyroidism. The production of reverse T3 takes place in times of extreme stress, major trauma, surgery, infection, chronic stress, malnutrition, or starvation. So if you're fasting too much, if you are not getting enough calories, calorie deprivation, you may have too much RT3, you're under a lot of stress, you have infection, you might have elevated RT3. Um, also, it can be related to nutritional deficiencies and things like zinc, selenium, B12, and iron. Anemia, for example, cause high production of reverse T3. TPO antibodies. These are antibodies to thyroid peroxidase enzymes. Now, thyroid peroxidase attaches iodine to the tyrosine backbone on the thyroglobulin protein. So thyroid hormone is this backbone protein of thyroglobulin. You have tyrosine amino acid that, that attaches to iodine, right, on there. And so again, T4 is four iodine attachments. T3 is three iodine attachments. If you have high TPO antibodies, that could be a sign of uh, autoimmune condition. And uh, especially, you know, obviously if you have the high TSH above 4.5, low T4 below 4.5, or below 4.5, yeah, um, and then you have elevated TPO or TG antibodies, which are antibodies to that thyroglobulin protein. Okay. If you have that, then that would be, you know, your clinical diagnosis in a sense of Hashimoto's. I believe they have to do a biopsy as well to, uh, you know, fully diagnose that and find antibodies in it. But, you know, that's what you're looking at with that Graves disease, obviously would be too much thyroid hormones. Your TSH would be too low under 0.5. And your thyroid hormone would be way up above 12, right? And, well, along with these antibodies being present. So Hashimoto's autoimmune disease, um, when we're looking at this, again, main antibodies are thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin. The TPO antibodies are high in 90 to 95% of autoimmune thyroid disease. So very, very common. And then TG antibodies are high in 70 to 80% of autoimmune thyroid disease. Now let's take a look at outside of primary hypothyroidism autoimmunity. Let's take a look at some of these other patterns. This is hypothyroidism or low functioning thyroid secondary to pituitary hypofunction, meaning pituitary gland is not functioning right. So it's not gonna be able to send enough TSH. 
Typical cause is stress from an active infection, blood sugar disorder, or unrelenting stress. We know that cortisol suppresses pituitary function. You can do an adrenal salivary index or the Dutch dried urine um, total dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. That's what that means, which uh, also looks at adrenal dysfunction. So you can see if you have elevated or decreased cortisol that may be playing a role with that. TSH will be below the functional range. So it'll be under 0.5 and your T4 will also be low. T3 may be normal, may be low, right? So if you're not producing enough thyroid hormone, you should get this signal from the pituitary gland to produce more TSH. So you can tell the thyroid to produce the hormone, right? Because that's the hormone that tells the thyroid what to do. So if you're low, low TSH, but then you're also low in T4, it's a sign that, okay, that, that mechanism of telling the thyroid, thyroid glands to produce the hormone is not working properly. So what do we do? We look for blood sugar. We look at stress. We look at infections that may be contributing to this. Um, also toxicity can also play a role like mercury, lead, things like that, that are damaging the pituitary gland. So again, looking at this, ask about relationship stress, financial stress, stress management in general, blood sugar stability, prioritize good sleep and rest, look at infections, blood sugar, um, postpartum depression. We oftentimes see this. The cortisol suppresses pituitary function, just they're not sleeping well, you know, trying to take care of the baby, and they end up with pituitary hypofunction. So that's what ends up happening there. Now, pattern two, thyroid underconversion leading to hypothyroidism. So your T4 again is inactive, has to go through a conversion process to become T3, the active form of thyroid hormone again. Conversion takes place in the liver and the GI tract requires healthy liver and good gut bacteria. So here in this pattern, you have normal TSH. So pituitary is working just fine. You're producing the T4 and enough free T4. So you don't have you know, an elevation or a decrease in the amount of thyroid bond binding globulin, like we had mentioned. However, you have low T3 and low free T3 levels. So your overall T3, your conversion of T4 to T3 is not working properly. And so what is the cause? Typically poor diet and gun function, that can lead to a deficiency of nutrients responsible for adequate function of the enzymes needed for conversion. So li sluggish liver, you're not getting enough of the key nutrients needed for phase two liver. Sulfation and glucuronidation are both very important pathways here for the, product, for the conversion of T4 to T3. And also zinc and selenium are very critical here. They help with that conversion of T4 to T3. A lot of people are deficient in zinc and also selenium. Zinc is one of the most common nutrient deficiencies and selenium's not far behind it. So addressing that and looking at what's happening there is important. So again, you know, this pattern, this is the same pattern that we're talking about. Normal T4 levels, but low T3. Liver and gut are responsible for 80% of that conversion. Remember I showed you on that chart, 80% of the conversion of T4 to T3 is from the liver and also, you know, 60% is the liver, 20% is the gut. So if you have bad gut, gut bacteria, right? If you have dysbiosis, infections in your gut, that can lead, um, you know, to certain nutrient deficiencies, which can lead to underconversion problems. So zinc and selenium are things that we need to look at, like low stomach acid, for example, is going to cause you to have poor absorption of zinc and selenium. So that's something we have to address. Gut dysbiosis, um, you know, so that's all that stuff is, is critical to be able to address. Now, one thing that I like to look at on blood work along with all the thyroid hormone is actually your plasma zinc to zinc to serum copper ratio, which should ideally be around one to 1.2. A lot of people have low zinc, high copper, and that can cause under conversion here of T4 to T3. And I see this very commonly. So we want to get that. We don't want too much zinc to where we have a copper deficiency. That's going to cause more problems in other areas of the body. However, we want enough zinc. And so there's a common problem where most people have too little zinc and too much copper. So we want to address that properly and keep it in the right ratio. And that will help with 
optimal conversion of T4 to T3. Now, pattern number three is elevated thyroid binding globulin. We talked about this earlier. This is your high estrogen pattern. We know high estrogen increases thyroid binding globulin uh, levels, which makes less free hormones. So you have normal or possibly high TSH, normal T4 and T3, normal or low free T4 and free T3. So you'll see both the free T4 and the free T3. So whereas the thyroid underconversion from liver uh, dysfunction or just overall underconversion, we saw normal um, free T4, but we didn't see normal free T3 or T3. So here, the difference is that the T4 and T3 that are bound, okay, uh, those are normal, but we're seeing the unbound, the low free or free T4 and the free T3 being low. All right. That is the issue here. And that's often caused by oral contraceptives, possibly hormone replacement, or just sluggish liver, because liver plays a big role in um, getting rid of excess estrogens in our system. And we're being exposed to xenoestrogens, BPA, phthalates, things like that from plastics, from personal hygiene products, uh, cosmetics, right? I mean, they're just all around us, our water, our food. So we've got to have good liver function to help get rid of these things, deactivate them and get rid of them. If we're not, we can end up with higher amounts of estrogen and we can have this sort of hypothyroid pattern. Also low testosterone can cause that as well. Like if we're insulin resistant, a lot of men develop andropause where they have insulin resistance and they have too much estrogen, not enough testosterone, and they can end up with a similar pattern as well. So again, lab evaluation, normal or high TSH, normal T4 and T3, but low free T4 and low free T3. So what do, what's important here? Remove excess estrogen, improve liver clearance of excess estrogen. Now, the reason why TSH may be high is because it, it gets a signal from the cells that it, they're not getting enough T3 activation in the cell. So it says, okay, we need, to, we need to produce more thyroid hormone. So it produces more. So now we have more you know, thyroid hormone circulating. However, uh, you know, it's being bound. So typically we just end up with low free T4 and free T3. So we need to, again, improve liver clearance, get rid of that excess estrogen, come off of things that possibly hormone replacement, oral contraceptives that may be contributing to this. Pattern number four, depressed thyroid binding globulins is the opposite. Now we have high testosterone. High testosterone reduces the amount of binding globulin, right? The binding hormone making more free hormones, right? So estrogen increased thyroid binding hormone. So we had less, um, we had lower levels of free hormones, right? So more binding globulins, less free hormones, less binding globulins, more free hormones. So now we have normal or sometimes low TSH because the, thyroid, the, the pituitary may be saying, okay, we're getting too much free T3 here. So we need to stop this signal to produce thyroid hormone. Normal or low T4 and T3. So sometimes this can trick people because like T4 will be lower, TSH is low. Now you're starting to think, is this primary hypothyroidism? But then what we see is high free hormones. So if we're not testing free hormones, which most doctors aren't, they may think this is, you know, a primary hypothyroidism, but they actually have too much free T3 here. So if they were to give a thyroid medication for this, that would actually be the worst thing they can do. Here, what we need to do is address too much testosterone, right? Because now this high free T3, now again, you think, well, that's a good thing. We need that to activate the metabolism. But what happens here is the cells themselves actually start to resist. They start to downregulate thyroid hormone receptors. And we end up with, because what you'll see in the early stages with this pattern is it almost looks like hyperthyroidism where you have very high levels of free T3. Okay. However, the TSH is typically normal in the early stages, and so is the uh, T4. So you're not seeing this very low TSH and high T4. That would be the normal pattern for hyperthyroidism. You're just seeing the high free T3. And then 
over time, the TSH may lower, the T4 may, may lower as the body tries to shut down production of thyroid hormone uh, because the cells start to resist, right? And the cells start to create resistance to the amount of free T3. So testosterone replacement or insulin resistance are the most common causes. And so you think about like for men, it's typically testosterone replacement. For women, it's usually insulin resistance. There's a common condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome in females that's associated with high testosterone. There's also um, a acne. A lot of females that have struggle with acne, oftentimes it's insulin resistance and high testosterone. Also a condition called hirsch hirschutism, if I'm saying that correctly, where females will have um, you know, a, a facial hair, right? And that can be high testosterone related as well. But PCOS is kind of the most well-known one and it's related to insulin resistance. So for some women, when they produce a lot of, of insulin, they end up producing a lot of testosterone, right? Doesn't happen for all women. A lot of women will have insulin resistance and that will actually bring down their thyroid or their testosterone and it will bring up their estrogen. So they'll end up with, you know, that other pattern where they have too much thyroid binding globulin. Insulin resistance can be a factor with that. But for some women, this is an issue. And then for men, it's usually they're, they're, they're doing testosterone replacement, right? So they need to lower that. Now, one other thing can be if you have, if your partner, so if you're a woman and your spouse is using thyroid hormone replacement and it's being rubbed onto you because it's on them, it can get through your skin transdermally and into your bloodstream and could potentially be causing this pattern. So that's another thing to consider. So what do we need to do? Balance blood sugar, reduce sources of testosterone replacement, and of course, improve liver clearance because our liver cleans up excess, excess um, hormone, right? So it'll clear up the excess testosterone. We just want to improve liver clearance. Pattern number five, thyroid hormone resistance leading to hypothyroidism. This is similar to what's happening here with the elevated testosterone and the elevated free T3, kind of the same thing, um, except it's not being induced by elevated testosterone. So in here, in this condition, we have just depressed thyroid receptor site responsiveness. So there's enough hormones. In fact, the labs look great, but the hormones are not getting into the cells where they're needed. Now, this is typically caused because of high stress and inflammation, which will cause the receptors, a lower level of receptors and a blunted response from the receptors where they're just not as, um, uh, they, they have a lower affinity to responding to the thyroid hormone. So with this, you know, we, we really need to focus again on blood sugar. We need to look at inflammatory markers, things like homocysteine, C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation uh, rate. We need to look at that. We need to look for chronic infections, other inflammatory triggers. Maybe somebody's not responding well to mold in their home or EMFs or something like that. This could be a factor in this. Now, oftentimes with mold, it's more of like that pituitary um, uh, hypo response, right? So where the pituitary gland is not is is overwhelmed and not able to produce enough TSH, we see that often with mold. But in some cases, it can be coming from this thyroid hormone resistance. This also, you know, if you have, for example, gingivitis or you know different oral infections, it can create a pattern like this where your labs look good, like your TSH, T4, T3 all look good, but you feel extremely fatigued. You have all these hypothyroid symptoms. So um, if you're noticing that, this is hard to pick up on labs because the labs look good, right? As far as not, I mean, typically we'll see the, the inflammatory labs not looking good, but your, your normal lab, your thyroid labs actually look good, but you're experiencing thyroid hypothyroid type symptoms. So again, we got to look at inflammation, stress and infections. Pattern number six, you know, this goes back to what we were talking about autoimmunity, right? So this is your classic kind of hypothyroidism, your Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. We're going to see the elevation in the antibodies with that, with the pattern number six. Now, here are some major factors that affect thyroid hormone function. So we need a lot of key nutrients, things like iron. Um, you know, we need iron because we need good oxygenation. If our oxygenation is going down, if we're anemic, that is going to dramatically affect thyroid hormone production. Typically, we're going to see an elevation in reverse T3 when you're anemic. Iodine, obviously that's the, the foundational mineral 
for the production of thyroid hormone. We also need the amino acid tyrosine, right? Which is the foundational amino acid in the production of thyroid hormone. So we need that. So we need good stomach acid, right? To be able to break down protein into amino acids to, to absorb tyrosine. We also need that to, to absorb zinc, selenium. Um, we also need enough vitamin E, vitamin B2, B3, B6, vitamin C, and vitamin D. Vitamin D is especially very critical for keeping your immune system functioning well so you don't get autoimmunity. That's the number one deficiency associated with autoimmunity is vitamin D. So to prevent Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, we really got to optimize our vitamin D levels. Factors that increase conversion of T4 to that reverse T3, like I talked about, stress, trauma, low calorie diet. So again, for under eating for a period of time, you know how they say that will lower your metabolism. The mechanism for that is this over conversion to reverse T3 and under conversion to active T3. Inflammation, uh, you know, obviously another big factor that can drive up reverse T3, toxins, infections, liver, kidney dysfunction, and certain medications can also contribute to that. Factors that inhibit proper production of thyroid hormones, again, stress, infection, trauma, radiation, different medications, fluorides, if we're getting a lot of fluoride in our water or dental products that um, can block thyroid hormone production, T different toxins, pesticides, mercury, cadmium, lead, and autoimmune diseases, because we're not going to be able to, particularly gut-related autoimmune diseases, because we're not going to be able to absorb nutrients effectively. So, you know, one in particular we know is celiac, but ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, those can also impact this. Factors that increase conversion of T4 to T3, making sure we're getting enough selenium and enough zinc. So seafood, wild-caught seafood, probably best source of these things, selenium and zinc. Brazil nuts, you know, we know that for can be helpful for selenium. We may need to supplement with some of these things uh, as well. Factors that improve cellular sensitivity to thyroid hormones. So now if we have enough thyroid hormone, but we want to make sure that we're actually getting it into the cell, right? So we want enough of those receptors. Here are the important things. Zinc, again, super critical here. Vitamin A, really critical. And exercise, this is where exercise comes in because exercise makes your thyroid hormone receptors more responsive to the thyroid hormone. Therefore, you're gonna uptake more. It's gonna activate the mitochondria to produce energy more effectively. So getting enough exercise. Now, when you're looking at labs, you know, again, you don't wanna just go in, tell your doctor, hey, I wanna, I wanna run my thyroid labs. They're typically just gonna run your TSH and your T4. They're not gonna look at your free T4, your free T3, your, uh, your normal T3, um, your overall T3, I should say. Oftentimes, they're not gonna look at your antibodies, your reverse T3, thyroid binding globulin, T3 uptake, your vitamin D, um, your homocysteine. Sometimes they'll run a complete blood count, maybe liver enzymes and a, uh, you know, a, a, a chem test, right? Looking at like different electrolytes, stuff like that. That's oftentimes what they will run, but they're not going to look at homocysteine, which is a critical inflammatory protein. They're not going to look at C-reactive protein. Oftentimes not going to look at your magnesium levels, your iron panel and ferritin to see if there's some sort of functional anemia, you're not going to look at your B12, your fasting insulin to see if you have insulin resistance. You're not going to look at these things, but these things all play a huge role. You guys just learned how they all play a huge role in what's happening with optimal thyroid functions. So when you're getting your thyroid hormone tested, you want to be looking at these things, or at least most of these to be able to get the full picture of what's going on. So now you guys know, and that's why we offer our comprehensive blood analysis, which looks at all of those things and so much more, including your vitamin A, uh, all your cardiovascular risk factors, your folate, B12, zinc, copper ratios, like I was talking about earlier, liver, kidney markers, all your blood sugar and insulin markers, your immune function, parathyroid, uh, which also is important with this, plays a role in calcium metabolism. So looks at all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you really want to make sure you're getting, when you get a blood test, you get it as comprehensive as possible that will give you as much data so you can really put the pieces together. If you're just getting a few data points and trying to guess, it's going to be a lot harder to make, make an accurate decision as far as what you need to do to optimize your health. So if you're out there, you're struggling, you're, you know, not, you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of these types of hypothyroid type symptoms or even hyperthyroid symptoms, make sure you get a comprehensive blood analysis and work with a really well-trained practitioner 
who can walk you through these results, help you understand what sort of pattern you may fall into and uh, really get you the kind of treatment that you need. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And of course, you know, I know I went through a lot of content, so be sure to scroll back where you can really look at these different patterns and better understand them for yourself. Compare your blood work, get your labs, compare them to what I was talking about here so you can better understand what's happening in your body and your physiology. Thanks again, guys, and everybody be blessed.